Thank you, uh, especially to Dr. Hawk and also Dr. Nina Hawk and Nick Lodge, who I happen to know uh, and had the pleasure of meeting a few months ago when we decided to work together. It's just a pleasure being here. Um, I, I just wanted to, before I start on the content, uh, you know, when you go to a conference, you always talk about takeaways. Uh, so the two takeaways I'm getting today are, number one, we talk a lot about giving and contributing and teaching others. But aren't we learning so much from, from people, especially when we travel, um, and hearing the experiences? Because people, whether they live in, in slums or they happen to be kids who are blind, they're teaching us to be culturally competent, culturally responsive. And uh, we're bringing that back to our communities here in the United States, whether we work with new nursing students or we work with nonprofits such as I do. They're, people are teaching me how to be uh, competent, and God knows we need that a lot in the world today. Uh, the second uh, point I want to say is kudos to these young people who are here that are so articulate, so bright, so intelligent. And you know, for most of us who are 60, not saying who, um, <laughs> Get, get nervous in front of talking in front of all these doctors and stuff, but oh my God, you rock kids, really. I, I'll tell you, I'm looking forward to you being the future of our, our nation and our world, so thank you for that. So I just want to start out with a quote from uh, Senator uh, Ban Ki-moon, who is the Secretary General of the UN. He, more than one billion of us live with disabilities. We must remove all barriers that affect the inclusion and participation of persons with disabilities in society, including through changing attitudes that fuel stigma and institutionalized discrimination. Uh, and uh, happy to uh, actually hear uh, Gopal Mitra this morning talking a little bit about that. So I'm going to do something a little different, because I'm going to talk about universal design and universal design for learning. Has anyone heard of those concepts? Hey, very good, excellent, good. So come on down here and join me. <laughs> um, but you know, we talk, we had a lot of great pictures, a lot of great visuals uh, this morning. Um, but some of us can't see, so I'm going to describe very briefly every time there's a visual on the slide. I hope those of you who don't, uh, you, those of you don't mind uh, that I do that. So here's a picture of a chef, uh, a bridal couple, bride and groom, and also some young people dancing. And, and really quickly, I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you, uh, left, right, what, whoever you want to turn to, and define yourself in one word. I'm going to get you to do a little activity after lunch. Just real quickly, define yourself in one word. Um, I heard. I happened to eavesdrop on the two gentlemen in the front, and they said intellectual and interesting. Did I get that right? OK. How about some other people? Just scream it out at, at anybody. Go ahead, scream it out at us. Well, either tell on the person that you heard it from, or, <laughs> or basically tell, give us a descriptor in one word of who you are. Anybody, come on, yell, yell, yell. Beautiful, excellent. Anybody else? Caring, excellent. Social? Excellent. Good, good, good. Okay. Huber. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, most of us, many of us, I should say, at least 20%, according to some statistics, uh, have a disability or have a health condition, right? A lot of it not apparent, so you can't see them here. I happen to be a person with a disability. I bet not one person described themselves as a person with a disability. Is that right? I may be wrong, but most of us probably didn't. And that's how we kind of talk about people with disabilities in our field. And I've been in the disability field all my life, and we use labels such as the disabled, the special education children, the autistic, wheelchair-bound, amputee, schizophrenic, ALS patient. And I'm pointing this out because I want to talk about the Convention on the Human Rights of People with Disabilities and how that's trying to turn that paradigm around. And here we have a picture of, of Stephen Hawking, who obviously is a person with significant disabilities, but you would never call him a person with a disability first, right? He's a brilliant scientist. So what's in a label? Label a disability does not define, it's not the person. It's created by poorly created uh, materials, bad attitudes, and not by the uniqueness of individuals. Stairs text others needing to be educated in our persistence to one way of doing things create a disability. So for example, my car breaks down in the morning. Do I call myself a disabled car operator? No, probably not. I call myself an employee that's asking, how the heck am I going to get to work this morning, right? 
So it's basically just as that car is broken, the steers can be considered the disability, not the person who can't manipulate them because there's no ramp. So here are the real disabilities. Traditional teaching methods, a uh, uh, picture of a teacher here, a female teacher that's not very happy. Um, traditional teaching methods including pencil writing, tests that include traditional text on paper, uh, doors that are too hard to open, elderly gentleman with a young kid opening the door, a picture of a person, again, traditional teaching methods, pencil and paper, not using alternative ways, stairs and uh, text that's too small, guy trying to read some text in a newspaper. So these are the real disabilities. So, so do you get it? you see the change here that we're trying to create in terms of what or, or who has the disability? The worst disability, as Gopal had talked about, is attitudinal disability. It's the biggest wall. We have to change that. So why is the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, so important? Well, first of all, Bangladesh was one of the first countries to ratify the CRPD. I'll refer to it by that. So hoo-hoo, Bangladesh. Um, and basically, states who ratify promote and protect the full and equal enjoyment of human rights by persons with disabilities, including children and adolescents. So it's basically a UN convention that if you ratify, you're legally responsible to comply with uh, everything in, in the convention. But the most important thing, it really represents a paradigm shift from a medical model, fixing a difference and having to have an accommodation on the person, uh, uh, basically to something where the environment needs to get fixed. So real quickly, it's a framework for creating legislation. Key areas include um, accessibility, personal mobility, health, education, employment, really every domain of life that we, that we know. Um, it uses a human rights approach to, uh, to remove barriers and prejudices that lead to the exclusion of uh, people with disabilities. So just as human rights protect other classes of people, now it also protects uh, people with disabilities. And most importantly, it talks a lot about nothing about us without us. Have you ever heard that? So people with disabilities historically have been left out of policies, legislation, rules, regulations. They haven't been involved. They, they have been uh, really developed historically by people without disabilities. Well, how the heck can uh, people without disabilities really know and have input like people with disabilities can into their own lives. So we have to realize that disability is the interaction between unique characteristics, that natural part of the human experience that we all have, and conditions, environmental, and personal factors. Disability does not define the person. And here's an example with two pictures here. Here's a child, I believe it's a young girl, who is blind. She has a chalk and blackboard uh, to use as a tool. Now that's probably not going to be the most effective for her versus uh, now technology, which is a person who's legally blind, a young child, uses an iPad with audio functions to navigate the browser while uh, she's searching for, for music. So, so, so see the difference? It's really not the person. It's basically the lack of the right tools, uh, Blackboard versus iPad. There's universal design, universal design for learning. Uh, universal design is very simple to understand. We use it every day. When we came in, there was a button to push for an electric door, right? So it's basically for people who using uses a wheelchair. But what else is that good for? Who else is that good for? Mothers, Mothers right. When I came in this morning, I had a, a suitcase and a briefcase rolling. Good for me. So that's universal design. Ramps on a sidewalk. It's good for mothers, again, someone doing a, a suitcase or a bike, right? So that's kind of universal design. It's more architectural building. The second piece of that, which is a little bit more abstract, um, not complicated, is a universal design for learning. And that's around teaching methods used particularly in schools, but also in areas of employment. And we really talk about these three concepts, the what, the how, and the why. The what is being able to provide multiple means of representation. It gives learners a variety of ways to receive and process information. So example, teachers can use color coding. Uh, a favorite is using international symbols and pictures. 
Uh, so basically, you know, you can go into an airport today and you can know where everything is by international symbols, ATM machine, bathrooms, restaurants, without having to read text, right? So it's good for people who uh, have literacy issues, may not be able to read languages, but also good for non-readers, perhaps because they have cognitive disabilities. So it's basically the multiple ways of, of representing tactile materials, video clips, highlighting text. The how is presenting, uh, providing multiple means of action and expression. And this is, this is where the testing gets in the way, not gets in the way, it comes into um, question. Because in today's society, in schools, we test by what? Paper, pencil, pen, right, for the most part? What this is pushing are multiple ways that you can prove that you have knowledge and you have obtained the knowledge, right? So it could be a photograph essay. Uh, it could be a video, uh, cor a video corded video cam <laughs> used. But it's basically a different way to present information to know that you got it beside a test. It's really good to know a lot of the Ivy schools uh, today, Ivy uh, colleges, are doing away with the PSATs because they know everybody is not good with traditional testing. It is not a way that uh, you can uh, determine someone's knowledge. The why includes a variety of ways that help students attend to and emerge in learning. Um, a lot of times we'll have students working individually, we'll have students working in teams without any um, assessment or any reason in terms of those, you know, just depends on what the teacher is wanting. Some kids work well individually. Some people work well in teams. So recognizing that and using that in the classroom as well as the workplace is fine. We have a research department, and I hope I don't um, insult any researchers here. We have a research department where we have some folks who don't like to be with people. I mean, they just assume walk over your dead body, then say hello to you in the hallway. But they're brilliant literature researchers. Sorry, researchers. Um, they're brilliant research literature. And they would love nothing better than to sit in their office all day long and review literature and not talk to people. That's their learning style. That's what we have to learn how to appreciate. So these are examples, actually, of each of these. And this is a very, very quick overview of this. I really would love you to get in touch with me if you want more information, and I actually have some curriculum on this. But here, we use the, the what in Universal Design for Learning all the time. This is a picture of a newspaper flyer with, uh, for a market, right? Someone can do plan their grocery shopping without having to read the text, right? Because you, you see this cantaloupe, this carrot, it's, it's a typical flyer where you can use this. And this is actually a universal design. The next picture you see is a cookbook that ha uses no text, but uses pictures uh, to, to show somebody how to do a recipe, basically cook a recipe. So that's an example of the what. The how um, is providing learners alternatives for demonstrating what they know, using visual flashcards rather than text. Students photograph progress before and after. Um, and then we have, of course, students working individually as well as in groups. The next one is the why in pro providing, uh, again, multiple means of engagement. And there's a little joke that I like to use here. And uh, it's a picture of a tree and also a picture in a row of a bird, a monkey, an elephant, a goldfish, and I think that's a seal and a dog. And there's a guy behind a desk who's saying to the, all of them, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. <laughs> OK? Brilliant example of our school system and how we have to kind of change the paradigm. So of course, you know, the elephant can be very good, but not necessarily climb the tree. OK, so it makes sense. We have to change the paradigm, change our way of thinking. Persons with disabilities are able to be employees, employers, entrepreneurs, students, consumers, inventors, musicians, contributors. And when it excluded, when people are excluded, we all lose out. Like think of if Stephen Hawking's had been excluded. Think if Dr. Hawk had been excluded. Uh, what, where would DCI be? The convention benefits all people, universal design features such as elevators, ramps, and clear signage assist many people. So it's not just, oh, we don't have money, we don't have the luxury of 
being able just to cater to people with disabilities because if we employ these, it helps all of us. You know, and sooner or later, uh, we will probably have a disability, uh, either when we're younger or when, when we get older. So just think of that. Strategies such as universal design, universal design for learning can be very inexpensive and sustainable. So let's think differently, and thank you so much. One more thing is that we are um, Institute for Community Inclusion. We fully support DCI as equal partners in our efforts to support and include children, adolescents, and adults with disabilities as equal and valued individuals. And we are going to be working with DCI aggressively to pursue other sources of funding, hopefully some federal fundings like USAID and, and the like. So thanks, thanks again.